take you back to when you started at Wards. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of training was there? Uh, at the time, uh, I was given the job of being a burner, basically cut and steel, uh, cut and scrap steel for the company. And they had uh, a German, uh, German destroyer or uh, warship of some kind. Uh, it was a very difficult kind of ship to, uh, to break up. It had mm, thousands of yards of cables inside uh, and copper. It was a very, uh, give them a good return on their uh, investment, but uh, it was a lot of hard work doing it. Uh, I got trained by um, uh, Mr. Uh, Mackay from uh, Burnt Island. He was, uh, he, he was there for a lot of years, maybe 15, 20 years before me. Uh, I was trained for a week and within a week I moved to right next to him because we worked alongside each other and he just kept an eye on me and, and that, was, that was it. What was your first impression of the yard? Uh, it's steel and sparks flying everywhere so I had to get used to it because that was actually my first full-time job. I had part-time jobs in hotel work hotel work in, the, in Tunisia during, uh, alongside my, stu uh, my student years but I never really had as, as hard a job as, a, as you have to get used to it or you have to see it to, to believe it was very hot especially in the summer time because the torch can uh, do quite a lot of uh, dust about and heat the heat of it was unbelievable but you get used to it when you have to do it you have to do it Itself. Did you wear any safety protection? We had oxygen masks and we had uh, like an apron, leather uh, apron, uh, boots, uh, took, uh, steel took up boots and uh, the overalls, we got overalls from them. That's, that's all the safety equipment you had. Wards was a different experience. Um, I was a young boy in Wards and amongst a lot of older men if you like, but I was there when the Mauritania, the last Mauritania, was just getting broken up. And I think you'd go far to find a house in Inverkeen and Recyther than Fairman or the ferry that doesn't have Mauritania memorabilia in its house, in their house. Because I know we certainly did. Um, when, when I, before I was married in Nor I lived in Norwell Place, my mother and my grand and my sisters, we had a huge mirror that came out of one of the dining rooms um, I can't remember the wood, it was, whether it was teak or it was all quality stuff, you know, all that sort of stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. And But the experience was something you couldn't buy. A young boy, it certainly opened my eyes. Um, the way I made so many friends from North Queens Ferry, um, so many friends from Inverkeeden, and there wasn't a lot of people from Resyth worked there. But Inverkeen and the ferry, it was like a house, you know, it was handed down from father to son, you got a job in, in wards um, because your father worked there or, or something like that, you know. It was really a really good experience. We, we used to get overtime when British Rail were replacing tracks, wards used to get the, obviously they paid for them, the old tracks which were wooden sleepers and the wooden blocks that went in their beds and you used to get overtime from I think it was half four to half six two hours every night or a couple of nights a week or whatever whatever you wanted and everybody wanted to be on the stripping as they called it because they knocked the blocks out and because they were a wee, a wee bit oiled or tarred everybody used to go home with a bag of rain because it was cold fires and you stuck it in the fire didn't they stink the house out it just went straight up the lump but you didn't have to buy coal or anything like that because all the wood was there you know it was great times and um, an accident at Wards? Yes, that was... Could um, you tell me that? What, you know of what that? I know of that is only what my father-in-law told me. I mean, he he worked in Wards and they used to bring the, the, the warships, the tankers, the liners, everything came in, the Mauritania and everything. And he was working on one boat and I think it was a tanker that the other guys were working on and there must have been... Um, fuel or something left in it and it just exploded and I can't hear it, I don't know, I've never actually read that the, um, I don't know, if, I think there was one guy killed 
but the other ones were, were severe burns and then they came Ward's management came forward and asked anybody wanted to sc uh, donate skin grafts and my father-in-law was uh, one of the guys that went forward to donate the skin grafts up to Bangor Hospital, I didn't know them at the time, up to Bangor Hospital and uh, I'm sure they took it from his thigh because he always had a funny mark on his thigh and then they were obviously up at hospital and they saved the guy's life, you know, so... It's very generous of your father-in-law. Oh, uh, there was four guys, I think. Four guys went up um, to Bangor. To, uh, I mean, at that time, I think it was it was quite a new process, really, you know. But uh, they all knew, seemingly they all knew each other, you know. And uh, the guy was quite severely burnt, you know. But uh, seemingly that the, the skin graft saved his life. So it was quite pleasant to hear about, you know. But... Uh, it's just, I suppose it's something you do in the spur of the moment. Yeah, you know. If it's your workmates, you go out and help them, you know. I must admit, the family, our family got an awful lot of help for the people that worked in the paper mill. You know, we, we had an awful lot of visitors from the paper mill. Um, management were good. I, I couldn't have fault the management at all. It was just a chance in a million, you know. Uh, I mean, probably even more than the odds were probably more than that. Just getting that exact mix, because I mean, it, it had been going from 1914 was the last sign I had seen on it uh, after the big fire that they had, and never had a, anything like that happen before. So I don't know what the odds were. So c can you explain the process to a total novice mm -hmm. who knows nothing about it? Mm -hmm. Do you start from the inside out or the top down or top down usually, and we don't start anything till they actually air the ship and let uh, the air in because, especially the tankers because they some of them actually had uh, chemicals or uh, fuel like petrol or oil, so they aired them up and emptied uh, any flammables, and then the, the work starts. Uh, but even uh, some of the hammers they used, they, they were bronze hammers, so when you use a hammer it doesn't make any sparks, because a single spark could actually cause an explosion uh, on board. And uh, we, we just got to know about those things with experience and that. Uh, Labourers were, were the only people allowed on the ship to air it and uh, get, get it safe for the burners to work on it. And most of the time it took about two or three months before anybody went on board to start cutting. Did some of these vessels arrive um, with um, all the furniture and things? Everything, uh, yeah, including the silverware, um, and anything that the captain used. When a ship is scrapped, everything stays on board, and basically it was scrapped. Uh, the silverware, uh, I believe, was sold on to maybe s silversmiths or whatever, and uh, yeah, the furniture most of the time was just uh, scrap. Uh, or if it's wood or whatever, they just burn it because they, they weren't allowed to sell on. I suppose some people bought uh, like uh, boats for fishing or whatever, from, because every super tanker or ship that came in had uh, like s rescue boats on board. So they had, they were sold on to individuals or companies, and uh, there a lot of hardwood on board. Yeah, tons and tons of hardwood uh, because uh, all the repairs on the ships were done on board. So there's uh, a joiner or qualified people to do that kind of thing. And you won't believe it till you see it. I mean, some of the hardwood on board is worth hundreds of thousands, and that goes as scrap. Uh, but once uh, the wood is emptied, uh, the rest just gets cut up to size and sent down south to different companies to reprocess it. So, as you kind of come in towards the end of the process and the ship's been emptied, mm -hmm. is it actually emptied inside? Can Are you walking in the hole? All the wood gets, uh, all the labourers start on the wood woodwork because the captain quarters and the staff quarters can have a lot of furniture that's got to be emptied because that would be a fire hazard if you leave it inside. But when you're burning anything inside, even the paint sometimes catches fire. Yeah. 
because uh, there is a lot of coats of paint on on board the ship. So you, they have to be very careful. And any wood or flamm flammables gets removed right away. Do you know what happened to the, the good hardwood afterwards? Was that sold on? I believe some of it was sold on to a company in Dundee. Uh, I believe he was a relation of the manager or the friend of the manager. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the, a lot of the, anything yeah, that can get used for second hand stuff. I think uh, a huge shop in Dundee was buying most of it. So, almost everything was getting recycled. Yeah, but not sold as the new uh, new items. They were all sold as scrap items, and whoever is buying the stuff knows exactly what they are buying. The wood, obviously, it's getting used for windows or doors, whether that's, yeah, I don't know much about that either. All I know, it was sold on to the shop in Dundee, and from then, I don't really know what happens to that. And there was overtime available, what they called stripping, on the ships that were in, or in the stripping sheds, and that, basically, it was separating everything, the, like, if you got dots and bolts together, you would separate them and there would be different categories, brass, copper, steel, um, alloys, whatever, and you had to categorise them. And it was such a, an easy shift and that was you from 11 o'clock till maybe 4 o'clock or if you got fed up you went away at 2 o'clock and up the volleys or something, you know. Um, it, was, it, it really was a good time, it really was a good time. Um, did you have any connection to wards? Um, Apart from my husband working there in, in his early days there, um, well, I actually went with him for his interview there. Because Tell he me did, about that. He didn't speak English at the time. Um, we, he'd just come to this country with me and he spoke um, Arabic, French, um, some German, a wee bit of Dutch, <laughs> but he didn't speak English. So we were actually married in French. But... Um, I went with him for his interview and John Ogg was the manager and John said he was a bit concerned because Deer didn't speak English and because of the health and safety and if there was an emergency you know it might cause a problem and I said well he's not stupid and John said well I know that um, and then he said well what's your maiden name so I said Dixon and he said who was your dad I said, Davy Dixon. Oh, I played football with your dad when we were all young. You can start on Monday and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> so that was that. And he was fluent in English within three months. So it was fine. But um, when our son was born, um, I'd given up my full-time work. And when Dad came out of wards, I went in and cleaned just for some extra money which wasn't the best job I've ever had, I have to say. <laughs> what did that involve? I mean, wards must have been a filthy place. It was filthy, yeah. The men, when they came off the ships and out of the yard, they they were, I mean, Dad would come in and just drop his clothes at the door so that I could put them straight in the washing machine. So, yeah, it was a thankless task, uh, but we had to do all the toilets. It was me and another lady. Um, a lady that I'd gone through school with, Sandra, and um, but you know you didn't think about it. You just did it. It was handy at the time. You did whatever was uh, fitted in, really. <laughs> did you work on one vessel at a time? At the time, uh, I believe uh, when I started my job, I was, we were working on the German ship. Uh, and I stayed on that right up till the last item of the ship was uh, scrapped. And then we got uh, two or three uh, oil tankers. Uh, after them uh, came the, the Maidstone. I don't know if you ever heard of it. That was a prison ship, a British uh, vessel. Uh, it, was, uh, it was deployed in, uh, I believe, somewhere in Northern Ireland for keeping... Uh, prisoners uh, from Northern Ireland in, on board the ship. Basically, it's, uh, uh, prisoners were brought onto the ship and uh, the ship was 
sailed out somewhere, and nobody knows where the exact area where the ship uh, was at the time. So people had a, the, they reckon it was uh, escape proof. Nobody could escape from it because you're in the middle of the Atlantic. So even if you get out your cell, you can't go anywhere. Uh, don't really know the names of uh, anybody that was held on board. But all I know was uh, Northern Ireland people, that's all. Uh, it, was, it was quite a shock, really, to go on board and see. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a comfortable ship. You can see uh, it's a prison, very much on water. That's the, that's, that's the only vessel uh, I've seen like that in my life. I've seen super, a lot of tankers, a lot of maybe uh, cruise boats, and things like that, but never a prison ship. Did it have individual cells then? Not individual cells, but uh, obviously uh, uh, people were locked up in certain rooms. Uh, I, I have no idea which room it was because I didn't work on board the ships. I was working on the shore, and uh, we, ha we received small parts of the of the boat at a time to scrap. I didn't see any cells or anything like that. Was there ever a gap between vessels being there available for you to break? No, oh, um, if you're working on one ship, they don't they don't uh, start a new boat till that ship is totally out of the water. And uh, uh, the warships were very difficult to break and they took longer, but the super, the, Oil tankers and uh, uh, in the oil tankers are maybe 50% easier to scrap and quicker to finish than uh, the warships. The warships were more complicated. So as soon as you finished breaking one ship, the next uh, one came yeah, in? Yeah. No, sometimes they had three or four ships lying uh, on, on site, but we didn't. We always worked on one at a time. We didn't, uh, and the rest of them were getting prepared to be scrapped because the managers and that knew exactly what they were doing. Or you, you might have been on one of the ships because you used to break up um, out of date frigates, minesweepers, and everything. We would all come in there, and they would break them up. And of course, the work lasted forever because it's an ongoing thing, you know. The Mauritania, I think it took them a long, long time to, to break that up. And then the dockyard, this, this is them sort of interlinked. When I was on the Gargani, the dockyard, again, as part of their um, strategy for testing and practice and things, sometimes when a, a warship was past its sell by date, they would take it down the fourth, down to the May Island load it with explosives and we used to take the explosives down it's barrels of explosives but they, and we used to carry them on deck but they're, they're safe as long as the detonators were in a different place and we, we used to take the, the explosives down then the, the people from the NCRE as it was then would take the explosives, put them in strategic places on the ship and then detonate it and we, we stood at a we anchored off a, a good distance away, and the explosion you, you could, and you, 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 the explosion you saw the ship lifting out the water, breaking its back, and it affected us as well. Although we were a good distance, the wash from it um, was quite, quite strong, and then that ultimately would get towed in towards, and it would get broken up. Couldn't go anywhere else here. A couple of tugs would bring it up towards, and that, that was your work for the next year. So, in those instances. Were the ships cleared of oils and, and stuff? Oh, aye, there was no contamination, uh, no diesel. It was uh, a couple of tugs would tow it down to the May Island because that was obviously the best place for it, the, the clearest place. Um, there, there, it wasn't, it wasn't going to affect houses, um, Burn Island, Kirkcaldy, or Inverkee thing, or Edinburgh, Granton, or that. It wouldn't affect any of them. So yes, it was cleared of everything, and uh, the, the explosives were put in strategic places, as if. Um, imitating a, a ship being hit with, a, see a torpedo amidships or in the stern a torpedo there or gunshots on the bow or the things like that, you know. But basically it was to, I think it was to see what impact it had mostly amidships because you used to see the ship coming up like that 
lifted out the water and it would go like that. You could actually see it. And it was all recorded on your specialist cameras. You could probably you could probably access them if you were to there'll be an archive somewhere. Um, you could uh, you could ask somebody for the pictures, the photographs. They were incredible. I, I saw quite a lot of them, like, and I was there several times when they blew up the ships. You know, it was really so that th those two jobs were sort of intertwined. Um, because if I wasn't working at Wards, breaking the ships up, I was working in the Gargani, towing it into Wards. You know, or taking the explosives to to make work for Wards type thing. You know, so. They were sort so, of intertwined. Just to clarify, the, the blowing up of these ships was for primarily for experimental research? Yes, experiment. Right. Experimental. Right. It wasn't just to make it easier to break them? No, no, no. It was experimental. When, whenever they... You know, it didn't have to be a frigate, it could be a destroyer or a, um, anything, just to see what impact. And obviously they've got the, the knowledge and the know-how to measure how much explosives they think would do it and see what damage on that amount of explosives did. So yes it was yes it was very experimental. One of the memories I've got is when the ships came into the the ship breaking yard they were supposed to be stripped. Uh, and by that I mean a lot of the fixtures and fittings, the alcohol and the food were supposed to have been removed prior to the ship coming into the yard but invariably that didn't happen so what what would happen is that the sh a lot of the fixtures and fittings would be taken down and how they decided who got what I don't know but um, one of my vivid memories is my dad always come into the house with various bits and pieces he used to concentrate on um, bringing food home because the ships would have freezers on them and food so um, I think Jackie as his workmates would call him would um, look to bring food home but you know the, 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 the various things that he used to bring home were quite amusing he brought home a pair of skis one day <laughs> but and and he would bring home certain other things. Um, he brought home a lovely ship's bell one day, and he painstakingly cleaned it because it hadn't been cleaned for years. I always remember um, my dad cleaning his bell, and I, I think he gave it to one of the local pubs to put up so they could ring last orders. Um, so, in alcohol, well, um, the, my dad used to tell me stories about the local customs officer. So when the ships came into the yard, the customs officer would appear. But of course, my dad and his workmates got to uh, work out that when he would be there. <laughs> so they would probably stash it on the ship and then remove it when they knew that the customs guy was not sitting along the end of the road under the bridge uh, in his wee mini. So these are kind of some of the things that I remember him telling me, that uh, avoid the customs man. Um, although he did say one day that they tried to get away an agreement with him that if they slipped him some alcohol that he would turn a blind eye to, to what was going on, but I think he wanted to do his job, so they, they tended to avoid that route. <laughs> but that was kind of some of the stories that he used to tell me about. Mm -hmm.